You never did know that that kind of that. Mean that. <laughs> That's my second so They put it <laughs> years on that I was the one that received it for you. Is that right? Yeah. Experience. Well, I'll thank you. Uh, thank well, you. Well, 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 Tender T goes a box of marijuana with a snuff box for it. Give him 30 years for it. Yeah. That's a good one. Sure. I really will. We'll love that. Anyway, I hope to be able to do so. You were acting in his behalf. Oh, yeah. Fuck my life. Don't give up. Because I've done 44 months on, I'm still out of time. So listen, don't give up. The case is still alive, you know. Well, look at this down. That'll be something. I need you now more than ever. Hey, what is it? I learned the parole board. Listen. When did you two guys meet? Oh, 20, 30 years ago. I was not 20 years ago. <laughs> you, you were out. Well, it was about 1960. 61? Uh, yeah. When, when, when you went to Harvard? Back at Harvard, 1961. When he came to visit Harvard, was that the first time you two? Yeah, that's the first yeah. time I met. 16, 16. They gave me. Depends on whether you, 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 you can't die or can't live. <laughs> I gave him a uh, hundred, uh, a tablet of five hundred, a bottle of five hundred tablets. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, didn't you say that you introduced Tim to CO2? Yeah, so that's right. I think I did. That's Right, he dragged us all around uh, yeah. Boston with these tanks, and we had people loading in the tanks, yeah. and he had us all strapped with the... Well, talk about stuff oh, it's fantastic. Yeah. 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 Never go to a party. Burn away to get it again. <laughs> well, I'd like to say, uh, just in general, I'm taking more SB now than I ever have before, at least once a week, and I find that uh, it's working better than ever. <laughs> it's a tonic, isn't it? Uh, yeah. yeah, you look very well. The new experimental forms are even better, so. Yeah. Uh, I just want that to get some attention. <laughs> That's the commercial. Well, what? Now we can go back to the prime time program. I must just fly around that. Otherwise, if I don't do this, I'll be killed. Well, listen, so what has it done actually well, through all the years? A great What's clarity, it done for it? A great clarity of vision, a great clarity of mind. Have we never seen we need a great, better off? Great perception. Oh, well, I don't say oh. that. I owe everything to you. I you think you would have. I think you would have. Galactic Center has sent you down just at the right moment to create a disturbance. Well, yeah, she well, likes disturbance. <laughs> well, General, what do you, what do you think is going to happen to it all, really? Do you, think we, no, do you think we're going to get it back in some form that we might be able to use it effectively or uh, under proper control or what happened? You're talking about bureaucracy and government. Uh, yeah. I, we, my wife and I, use more LSD now than we ever, than I ever did in the past. And sensible people are still doing it. Yeah. And what happens in Sacramento yeah. or in Washington or in Beijing or in Saigon has yeah. never affected us and never will. But well, he was certainly <laughs> worn them out. There's no use in them bothering you anymore. What? Oh, There's no I use them bothering you anymore. I don't mind being bothered. <laughs> no, you seem to be indestructible. <laughs> Well, when you started with it all, Al, I, yes. I mean, Al did, when you started with it all, I mean, you know, 
You, you had some kind of a purpose or vision in mind then, didn't you? Uh, uh, I still got it. Yeah, well, and you... I'm in my mind. And you're responsible for carrying it, you know, you're the Johnny Appleseed here, <laughs> LSD. You know, planting it every way you got a chance. Huh? Well, I, yeah. I sure did, but uh, uh -huh. I don't think it was a credit thing. It was a credit thing, something yeah. should have been done, and I tried to do it. And I'm still trying to do it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And what, why? Why, Al? Why are you trying to do it? I don't know. What are you, what are you doing it for? Well, I don't know. Just, I think it's a thing to do. <coughs> well, could no guy my age do is worth a doing. <laughs> hmm. You're looking for some sort of motives, no, I guess. No, no, no. What I'm looking like for... Freudian motives? No, or no, no. Political not, not, motives? No, no, no. I was just wondering... Economic motives? Or no, no, no. I was wondering because <laughs> I thought that Al had some really personal interest that, that had reflected something in his own experience. It cost me a couple hundred thousand dollars. I don't yeah. know. I don't know if that's a good motive or not. Well, <laughs> I'm not not to mention my friends, but I caught that. <laughs> <laughs> they all contribute freely or willingly or unwillingly they contribute. <laughs> what do you think it's best use is for now, Al? Hmm? I don't know, just keep on doing it. Just to keep on waking people up, let them see themselves for what they are. I think old Carter could stand a good dose of it. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe maybe Brown, Brown yeah. maybe Brown up the Pentagon, turn around and do him a world of good. Let's <laughs> sit in here, something. Oh yeah, I'll pop there. Don't worry, Tim. I'll, yeah. <laughs> I carried out my. But I do wish you. I, 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 had I do wish you stop scooping stuff getting in bad. Getting what? Getting in bad. Bad. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, everything's worked out. Very, very well, I'm very respectable. I like that uh, new Rolling Stones, you know, uh, song about you talk, talking heroin with the president. We're so respectable, we're so unobjectionable. <laughs> Nobody's bothering me. Are they bothering you? Don't bother me. Nothing bothers me. I don't see, I don't see anyone in this couch that looks being, being bothered. If something gets on my back, I get it all. <laughs> Bill Harmon says uh, there's a nice way to do it. I don't know what a nice way is. Hi, right, Bill. You say you can be gentle about it. Yeah. It's your phone, guys. I'll leave it with you. <laughs> well, I'm very gentle. You just remember the first time we met, which is in Cambridge, uh, uh, in, in 19, on the night of the Kennedy election. 1960. In 1960, we, we went out to this place, uh, and T Timothy then was wearing his uh, grey flannel suit and his crew cut, and we had this very interesting uh, discussion with him. And when we went, I don't think I ever told you this, Timothy, but when I went, we went away, uh, we both said, uh, what a nice fellow he is. And he said, he's a very nice man, and, I, and, and all of a sudden, it's very, very nice to think this is where it's going to be done at Harvard. It should be so good for it. And then, and then, and then I said to all of a sudden, I, said, I think he's a very nice fellow too, but don't you think he, that he's just a little bit square? <laughs> All the second, you may well be right. He said, after all, isn't that what we want? <laughs> 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 and Timothy, when, when, I'm, when I'm discussing my, the need for understanding human temperament, this is the story I tell, because I said, here all this night, we're deeply interested in the nature of human temperament, and we meet someone who I think that was probably the least satisfactory description of you ever made, Timothy. I think even your greatest enemies would never make that description. <laughs> and we made it. We were very, very concerned because we felt that you were perhaps a bit too unadventurous. You see what insights we had. <laughs> well, you sure, you sure think contributed your part. But uh, I've always considered myself very square. Yeah. So we were right in a way. Where we I always try to hang around the hippest person in the area. <laughs> 
and every <laughs> continue to do that because <laughs> uh, I feel that I, I really beg to see I'm square and I have very little sense of aesthetic so I try to hang around the most sophisticated beautiful people in the world so hope some it will radiate off on me I have other qualities though you see all create the sense of self-improvement it's all very actual <laughs> no, it, was, it, it, it was one of, one of the most mo monumental ill judgments. That, but it was very, very interesting. We had, we had a very good evening, but uh, we were not able to drink anything because, because apparently the laws in Massachusetts are such that when an elections are, no one's allowed to drink because of fear that you would corrupt the voters. Well, all these concepts of, uh, of the you know, high concepts of political this or that, I think uh, somebody around when I used to say to Sydney all that, I felt that I was much more conservative than you, Sydney, because I didn't want the government involved in any of our business. <laughs> and I thought that was a pretty free enterprise, <laughs> staunch. <laughs> we seem to have followed our own paths. <laughs> <laughs> you yours, me mine, he his. <laughs> Fortunately, since they didn't go in the same direction, a great deal of ground was covered. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess uh, one of the things Oscar might be interested in is what does it all mean and how is it all going to work out and all that sort of thing. And I wonder whether I know I couldn't possibly evaluate. Would yeah. anyone, any, anybody want to try? Yeah. <laughs> Gosh, I was really interested in your opinion. Well, I think, it, it, as you heard, it stirred people up. It cracked their frame of reference uh, by the thousands, millions perhaps. And um, anything that does that is pretty good, I think. Uh, anything that shakes people up a little, not too much. Uh, some people maybe it shook up a little too much. That was unfortunate. But uh, in the totality, it may have been a desirable thing at that point in time. Uh, the next question would be, well, what's going to happen? And there I think we will see, not soon, but uh, in X number of years, a recrudescence of similar usage here, there, and everywhere. It's happened throughout history, hasn't it? Yes. So don't you think that the, the, the other very important thing is it's the, t the, the actual time that's has happened to begin with. As you point out, it's very good for people to be shaken up a certain amount. So far on the whole, our ways of shaking ourselves up have usually to have real uh, um, cataclysms. I mean, for instance, the Iranians are being shaken up at the moment. But it would appear that many of them might prefer not to be in this kind of way. Because the difficulty with having these great, the great cataclysms is that you, you end up worse than you began. The, the, if one could be able to have a sort of controlled cataclysm from time to time, we'd be much better off because we, every society gets set in its ways and the society with a vast technology is always likely to get to the point when it's simpler and easier and comfier to um, let the technology take over. And one of the things it seems to me that these substances and the attitudes they generate very well is that one becomes less willing to do that because it's not necessary. You, 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 are able, you don't have to look upon your technology as your idol. And it, it's, very, it's, it's easy to do this. And it's particularly easy to do this if you've got no way out. It's easy uh, if, you, if, you, if you're able sort of to separate yourself. So you means. think that uh, in days to come, as we become more constricted and more uh, homogenized, that it may be even more necessary to have such... Much more necessary. But I think it's still very necessary because uh, we, we, we are so clever at, at, at building the, all these strange and remarkable things. And, and the, But then the thing that we stop being clever is that we're very liable then uh, to make ourselves in our own image. I mean, it's extremely interesting, the image of the things we've made, rather. It's very interesting that the, the mind described by... Uh, Thomas Willis in 1670 was of a kind of mirror. And the reason why he described that, the mirror was an extremely fashionable new invention. Then the, 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 the mind that Freud described, if you remember, was a magic lantern. That's why projection comes from. And it, 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 this was the latest thing. Now the mind... was an indoor plumbing system. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Then, then the mind became a telephone exchange. Then, wow. not, not, the, 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 I you gather... ready for that one. The, the most, the most, then, it became, then it became a kind of television thing. And I gather the latest thing to say 
it's a hologram. Now, the only thing that we know is it's none of those things. The fact is that we've invented all those things, and it's a, apparently a thing we always do. Now, now, uh, now, as long as we don't take it too seriously, but, but it seems to me one of the things that these substances and the techniques you learn from them is they help you not to take it seriously. Now, they, they, with, with the other people, uh, with other people, that, they, that none of them have, have ever managed to make, it seems to me, such an, in, an intrusive technology as we've made. It, it's always been much more difficult. Our technology is, is, is sort of marvelously able to do things which would have uh, only tyrants could have done otherwise. Only tyrants could produce vast entertainments for themselves. We get vast entertainments for ourselves whether we want it or not. And, and it's, uh, therefore we need to have wa ways of dealing with it. I think Aldous was uh, completely right in uh, both, in both uh, the, his moralities, in, in Brave New World and in uh, part of Ireland that uh, our needs now are very great. And since it doesn't seem to me that we're likely to, to dis-technicalize ourselves, because even if we wanted to do this, if we were able to do this, I don't think we can, but suppose we were, no one else is going to do this. <laughs> so the result of our, our sort of removing ourselves from the pastoral life would be that someone would come over and take over the continent. They'd be bound to. But it, would be, it would be too much of a temptation for, uh, for anyone w with a, a technology in being to see us like the, uh, the say, the Americas in 1492. Oh, yeah. Listen, but can I interrupt just one yeah. second? You, you mentioned in the names. Uh, has it been done yet? I think we should uh, uh, say hello to Aldous Huxley. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and to Gerald Hurd, yes, we should. Uh, and Alan Watts. And to Alan yeah. Watts, who was the most underestimated yeah. of all right. the philosophers of our time, and uh, they're here with us. And uh, and to say hello to Art Chandler, by the way. All right, Daddy. hello, Art. Right. Remember Art? Right. Right. Been going back a long way. Yeah. Yeah. And those of us in those days, uh, I don't know that we fancied what we were heading into. Maybe we might have been willing to call a halt then at the time. But somehow, <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, we were we were really getting into some things that, uh, from different directions, everybody was finding their own way. And I'd like to say, does, yeah. does anyone here feel that, mis that mistakes were made? Or <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, yeah. yeah. What mistakes were made? Well, uh, Timothy, uh, estimations in retrospect are in principle unfair. It's really like the chaps, you know, who when the, the, the generals of World War II had large numbers of fellows who were not born at that time, who write interestingly accounts of how the Battle of the Bulge might have been better fought. <laughs> it, it's only too well, that's easy. wonderful. It's, it's only too easy. Everyone's going to write their own sure. cosmology. That's right. <laughs> but, but I mean, I think that... The world was, was made in seven days, but where and when? Yeah, but I, but I, I think that those sort of things uh, um, one could I don't think of the same mistakes well I say you could have seen other ways of doing it my god quantum physics yeah. now tells us that in any second it can go in how many different ways yeah, yeah well, that's one of the yeah, so that was a mistake made nobody gave it to Nixon <laughs> <laughs> well in order to know whether mistakes were made you have to know what the goal is that's and if you can define a goal, I can tell you whether mistakes were made. I think mistakes were made, but that's my own personal goal. Well, I'd say one of the goals was to make uh, the American people smarter, raise their intelligence. And I think the American people today are quantum jumps more sophisticated in exactly the general directions in which we uh, all hope they would become more sophisticated. About consciousness, about the nervous system, about the brain, about the options mm -hmm. people have in creating their own reality, about self-actualization, self-indulgence, about uh, pleasure being a self-reward as opposed to high reward. My God! Uh, pleasure is now the number one industry in this country. <coughs> Recreational travel, uh, entertainment, uh, sensory indulgence. Oh my God, it's now, you know, no question about that number one. Now, that was my goal. <laughs> <laughs> In this case, you, may, you, you certainly made an advance towards it. However, let me put the slightly contrary point of view. <laughs> this is that we, we, we have the, 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 awkward, the, the awkward thing that we now have chaps like the Ayatollah Khomeini appearing on the scene with other, who have the potential of rather different goals. 
and, and, and certainly from the, where, where I do, which you know very well, in, in the South, these, di these other different goals are always potential. All right, Pakistan is now going back where they're going to yeah. cut off uh, ha hands for the first uh, robbery and foot for the second. Uh, Iran is now going back to... Uh, no, no, you made the interesting point about uh, hands, don't you? The Afghanistan is now... No, no, Jerry, Pakistan is going to do this, but they haven't been able to get the doctors to do it. Which is, I think, is extremely interesting. One thing I've learned from the criminal justice situation, there'll always be someone to lop the hands off. <laughs> They've got to lock them off now in a civilized way, and they, they haven't been able to do that. Well, what was your point, Jim? Yeah. About, about, oh, my point, yeah. Uh, about the Ayatollah? And I still haven't so. been able to levitate that yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tim said that he was quite successful in achieving his goals. Yeah. Well, and I think I, he's a little presumptuous. Yeah. <laughs> well, who's my, my goals? I, I'm not simply talking about my goals. That's right. I'm totally not withdraw the presumptuous. Uh, he's, he's, he's optimistic, not presumptuous, and he ought to be optimistic. I mean, it's his natural bent. But since we all live in these uh, yeah. bubbles that we create, uh, we can only uh, basically uh, um, give ourselves our own report cards at the end of every uh, and so forth. Take credit for that which we didn't do. <laughs> <laughs> so we didn't, well, uh, credit, no, I take no credit. Uh, or blame, but and we're talking about goals. See, that's different, isn't it? Credit and blame gets uh, it's another interesting topic. So, then how would you like to have seen it done? Yeah. Suppose the scenario had been played as you'd like. Well, I don't put as high a stock on pleasure, although I enjoy it, as Tim does. Uh, I, I would hope that um, increased human wisdom might have been an appropriate goal increased human humaneness this I don't quite see as occurring I don't think we're any wiser some of us may be uh, and uh, maybe if only a few of us are wiser that's enough that's sufficient unto the end um, at this point I would like to apologize to you Sydney uh, you were right in most of our debates when you were insisting upon uh, uh, <laughs> I want a copy of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Why do you say that? Well, because you were uh, insisting upon more scientific rigor, and you were emphasizing intelligence, where I was emphasizing consciousness. Now, I think I was robot programmed to do that, so I don't regret doing it, but uh, it was like... Uh, it was in the third quarter of a game we played once in the Houston Astrodome when you, you know, several times, you definitely uh, were saying things. I remember you were quoted in the New York Times after one of our debates as one of the quotes of the week. And it said that you didn't believe that we should be encouraging the evolution of a new species of primates that went around smelling flowers. You remember that quote? I remember it. Roughly something like that. And you were right. I don't know whether I was right now, come to think of it. <laughs> well, but Tim, you know, you and I had an agreement once, too, the last time I saw you. <laughs> you know, we, we have our differences of view, and, um, and we were... Uh, we were a little disturbed that some of the things you were doing and planning would make it more difficult. In fact, even at the time I saw you, it was making it more difficult to carry on legitimate research. And we agreed, you know, if you remember that, well, Myron, you stay in there and uh, you do the le legitimate research, but you need somebody to kind of shake them up a bit. And so I'll shake them up and then you can, you can take them and, and, and show them the, where they can learn what the right path is. But I didn't know that when you're going to shake them up, you're going to hit them on the head with a ball bag. <laughs> well, I don't accept that. <laughs> I have had this experience four times in the last 15 years, 20 years. I was one of the um, uh, younger members of that incredible revolution led by Benjamin Spock, Abraham Maslow, Carl Rogers, Rollo May, uh, Harry Stack Sullivan, and none of us would be in this room if it hadn't been for the work of these uh, people who are essentially giving conscious psychology back somehow to... Uh, to uh, human access, taking it away from experts, so that I definitely feel that I'm a product of that group. 
which was essentially a totally American point of view, psychology. They were giving us an American psychology of do it yourself, trust your own impulse, you're out there in the frontier, you're having trouble out there, you can't call a Viennese psychiatrist and so forth. And then in the 60s we had um, the, uh, um, the same situation. Uh, I went farther out in those days than uh, uh, Carl Rogers did. When we were at Harvard in that, in that 50s revolution and so forth, we were giving away the answers to intelligence tests. <laughs> we were giving away the answers to personality tests. We were doing everything in our power to, because we felt that the psychiatry of the time was making people more helpless instead of giving them... So uh, we were in a lot of trouble at Harvard, you know, uh, reversing roles. There was Charlie Slack who was paying... He was paying patients more money than he was paying the uh, graduate students. That's one example of hundreds of uh, role reversals in psychology before drugs. Then the drug thing came along, and I made several. Dis I had several discussions with Sydney and with you and with uh, everyone, saying, and with you too, I was saying, uh, let us be the far out explorers, and the farther out we go the more ground it gives uh, the people at Spring Grove to denounce us. So we were like your flanker backs mm -hmm. or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. We were the, uh, f yeah, very Front right. Runners. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I never mm -hmm. felt for a second the, the hundreds of times that we debated anything but this uh, wise affection from you, Sydney, that we were somehow, to the best of our abilities, um, working for human freedom as we saw it or playing uh, so that... Uh, uh, and I felt that um, the particular role, role that I was playing then was to, uh, and I never knew, we never knew what we were doing you know, in any clear, precise sense, uh, but it seemed always right to us. Then I had the third experience. I was in Folsom Prison when the notion, I began to understand that space conversation was the same issue, that the notion of going into space had been taken over by NASA, by the Pentagon, by uh, the Soviet Soviet. And again, it was the, I wrote, I wrote uh, Professor uh, O'Neill at Princeton a letter saying, well, my friend, this is the third time I've been through this, and I'm telling you that I'm going to popularize space migration in the next two or three years because it's got to be, uh, you know, people in general have got to, a new generation, young uh, people in, in college, young physicist students and young sociologists got to realize that some of the big issues ahead of the control of space got to be taken away from the, you know, the, the good guy, bad guys who are all at the Pentagon and so forth. And um, now there's a fourth, uh, fourth, uh, there's a fourth time I'm involved in a situation like this. Genetics, uh, the DNA code and that sort of thing is more important for the next decade as the brain was, who's going to control the brain in the uh, late 60s and 70s. And I, I always see my role as the same. I wrote the same letter to Edward Wilson. The very same uh, message that, uh, you know, same discussion that I had and once in a parking lot with you and uh, Palo Alto. And I wrote Professor Wilson of Harvard. You know, he wrote sociobiology and his new book on human nature, very interesting stuff. I said, look, this is the fourth time I'm going to do everything in my power to popularize the DNA code, uh, Gaia, wisdom, egg intelligence, genetics, genetic cast, structural cast, so forth. And I'm going to take it too far. It's going to be radical sociobiology. <laughs> but I'm not interested in persuading uh, the full professors, the full scientists. I'm going to be talking to the undergraduates and to the high school students, and I'm going to be outrageous, and I'm going to suggest the possibilities of genetic um, research so that in five or ten years, when they will have had their PhDs and their MDs and so forth, uh, they'll, you know, because it always happens, it's called neoteny, you always have to send the message to the, the sexually active pre-adults, and then they will figure out what's right and what's good from all that, and then they'll go ahead and perform it for the functions of society that I have the next generation, so that uh, I see it all as an incredible loving hookup of people playing different roles, and I've never complained or never explained uh, that I know of uh, about being mistreated, and I I don't think so. Uh, and I, I, just, I just wish, I hope, that we all understand that we've all been playing parts that have been assigned to us and uh, uh, there's no uh, good guy, bad guy, or more credit or blame or whatever. You were uh, what Gerald Hurd would have said. Uh, you were on the cutting edge of things and that's probably where you belong. Tim, I don't think I ever congratulated you on writing one of the best escape books.
I don't know if everyone here has read Timothy's be uh, his escape book. It's one of the very good escape books. <laughs> it, it was uh, that was rather foolishly, I think, uh, over publicised and didn't get the thing going the right way. But it's, a, it's one of the best escape stories I've ever read. I'm something of an aficionado of escape stories, and it's one of the very, very good ones. Not good, tapping on. <laughs> no, but it's true. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, Papillon gives you the, 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 the feeling that it was being written for a movie. And unfortunately, yours hasn't been made into a movie, but it's, 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 a, it's a very good one. Well, I tried to sell the rights before the escape, but Hollywood w wasn't ready. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose that, that, that would be the best possible move. The movie coming out before you escape. Yeah, uh, <laughs> when the weathermen came up in a car after I escaped, I did the weathermen, and I turned and I, they, <laughs> they had fa false passports, they had false clothes. I said, didn't you videotape this, you fools? <laughs> and they didn't know. Um, well, here we are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great tribute to ask you. Well, well, but, 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 yes, how, would you, how would you like to have seen it go? And I want to know how Al would have liked to have seen it go, because I think that what we're uh, in here, one has a sort of uh, a, 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 t a temperamental. Uh, 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 network or, or grid system in which people were seeing the same thing through somewhat different lenses. Well, I think we need people like Tim and Al. Uh, they're absolutely necessary to get out, way out, too far out, in fact, uh, in order to move, uh, move things around. And we need people like you to be reflective about it and to study it. And, uh, and little by little, a, a slight movement is made in the totality. So, you know, I, I can't think of how it could have worked out otherwise. Uh, I must confess that when I studied LSD, and then I heard that was getting out on the streets, I said, this this will never sell. It's too intense. People will, will be too shook up. But it, it didn't work that way at all. I'm not quite sure I know why, but apparently people were able to sustain it, uh, this intense uh, response. So my uh, record as a prophet is about one down. <laughs> well, and aren't so you right, though, if you take a longer range view, because from what I know, maybe I'm not well enough informed, but it's not a popular street drug anymore the way it once was. I think a fair number of people are take, still taking LSD, don't you yeah, think? Yeah, but there's stuff on the street, you can't call that LSD. <laughs> Yeah, not oh, wait a minute. <laughs> 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 Al, 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 perhaps you haven't been assiduous enough in, in getting the good stuff. I can't believe you, you failed to find the good stuff. You well, no, because I had 4,000 bottles of it to begin with. Yeah. <laughs> Never, 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 never. You're, you're, in, you're in the position of a man with an excellent seller who isn't going around looking at the new because I never sold you. You're not new, I mean, you're, you're not looking at the recent vintages to see how they're coming along. Well, do you think the hippie movement would have come about without LSD or had its impact? I think that would be a totally different impact. What? It would be a totally different impact. <clears throat> I don't think, and I mean much less. I, I, I think it was a necessary uh, condition for it, really. What about heroin? Do you think we would have had a heroin epidemic for that LSD? I don't mm. think it has any bearing on it, Dr. Mm, may have had some bearing. I think it had some bearing, but... Uh, well, it's like saying when you have well, a CB a thing, uh, when you're giving people the, the concept of self-actualization, yeah. they can do things that formerly only experts can do, naturally. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to be... Well, there's, there's other drugs. You have a guy, Prince, making an atom bomb. <laughs> Damn. There's other drugs. There's at least 15 others that act entirely differently. Yeah. That would still come out that no one's ever said anything about, that we've isolated in the last 10, 12 years that are far more remarkable than LSD. Mm -hmm. They really tell you which, which way you're going. All, that, all the harmaline compounds and ayahuasca and all that stuff, we've got all that. I think another person we ought to mention uh, as not being here but here is John Lilly. Yeah. Well, he will be. He will be. Oh, he will be. Yeah, he's going to be here shortly. John What a courageous And Laura Hutchinson will be huh? here. Too. She'll be here shortly. 
So everybody took their chances, I'll tell you that. In some ways, I think that John, uh, you know, we all work within the ranges and so but John has gone so far and taken such risks uh, that I just think he's You'll be there when you get there. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> You know, Tim, I think everybody took risks in their own way, you know? Oh, I know. They're not just uh, flying around in the stratosphere one, yeah. or, you know, or standing their time in tanks and the other, but there were people who were really working in areas that were very frightening and sometimes uh, very awesome to them, and trying to integrate that and still move along and do what they had to do. And I, I think people like, uh, like Art Chandler and so on, and Bill McLaughlin, uh, and Ron Siegel and as I look around the room have had the, you know to walk out on a very very long narrow plank too and look around and uh, in their way I, I think brought back some very good things you know I, I think you know it's an interesting thing too as you go around the country I'm sure you all have this experience you talk to uh, middle-aged, fairly respectable people in Tucson, Arizona, and they said, this is where the asset thing really happened. <laughs> Tucson. In San Francisco, this is where it really happened. The Lower East Side, you know, they said, that's where it really happened. And uh, yeah. the, uh, no one has ever really um, um, told us what was going on in Los Angeles during those uh, years. I think much more was done down here. There was a much wider range. There were more doctors involved. There were more scientists involved. We had Gerald and Aldous. Yes, right, right yeah. And uh, Ivan, uh, of course. Uh, and, uh, of course, it was part of the coolness of the Los Angeles uh, cell, whatever you want to call it, that they kept a, uh, you kept a... Uh, well, you might not call yourself, let's call it a cluster. <laughs> Our undercover agents in Los Angeles were very cool about, uh, uh, and yet they did more in a very uh, laid-back way. Uh, and it's never been as public, public as uh, some of the other, uh, yeah. you know, the buses running around the country. Yeah, and then Zinberg that. says that the visionary experience and all the things he was doing at Harvard and the others, his residents and the rest of his giving LSD to, they never had a visionary or an ecstatic or a mystic experience, but the whole thing was a California invention. He said, and he said, and the only well, time it ever happened right. was when you crossed the Colorado River. <laughs> you know, I'm reading John, uh, John Mock's book on um, yeah, yeah. the Manchurian, uh, Search for the Manchurian yeah, yeah. Candidate, in which he says that uh, the CIA turned us all on, you know. Well, uh, but <laughs> it, uh, I'd like to get your opinion uh, of... What started it? Was it Aldous Huxley's dose of perception? Was it Tim Leary? What, got a, what made the mass uh, use of uh, psychedelics uh, come on, would you say? Well, no, see, we have to mention the name of Ken Kesey, and of course, Allen Ginsberg was a, Allen Ginsberg was an indefatigable Zionist politician for drugs, and they, uh, uh, so that But they, at the very beginning, what would you say? What turned you on, Tim? I don't remember. And Gordon Watts? Don't ever underestimate the effect of that wonderful, respectable, uh, far out of mind. Yes. In Life magazine, there is a banker, Morgan Guarantee, Morgan Guarantee Trust banker, lying on the mud hut of a Mexican, uh, you know, saying wonderful, wonderful, <laughs> oh boy, talk about Joe Namath uh, commercial. <laughs> Sid, we ran close to a thousand people through, and these, each of these people were people that had considerable influence in their own right, and they were bringing the message out. Who turned down Cary Grant? So, uh, someone in this room, you know, <laughs> but I mean Cary oh, Grant. Sir. Hartman, <laughs> well, yeah. Hartman, then. and then I, I saw him a few times. Yeah. But we each of us had, and so this thing was just moving geometrically from people who had large audiences themselves, and the rate of the way inquiries were coming in was geometric after a while. And obviously, it, 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 if that continued, these people who then couldn't get it from us anymore would be seeking to get it elsewhere. Yeah. And it was that kind of a proportion that was taking place. That was, and keeping in mind, because that was just a, a, a relatively small ripple in a larger bond, but it was, it was carrying a lot of impetus with it. 
And, and that might have been one of those things, and then those enclaves joining other enclaves and, and so on. Uh, but I think you're referring to the big explosion of the... Uh, the big explosion uh, yeah. was when it came yeah. out on, yeah. the, on the cover story on all the popular magazines, right. Life, 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 Saturday Evening Post, yeah. and the, the whole yeah. business that were back, yeah. that were all... Well, Alice's that. book, uh, Doris of Perception, Heaven and Hell, were extremely important among intellectuals. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And Frank Barron was another person who was uh, very active in the psychology. Uh, of course it was Albert Hoffman who did it all anyway. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> yes. yeah. Your question, I think, really is directed at that uh, where did the young people get it? Because that's where the movement started that really spread it yes. across the country. What do you think about Robert Duroff? That had a lot of effect where I was. In fact, I was very surprised when I saw he the second, second, the second of the county chapter. <laughs> <laughs> so that, but didn't that drugs in the mind have a lot of effect yeah. on campuses and stuff yeah. like that? It did. But it was more than just a book or two. It, it was something in the wind, and I, I really wonder. The first major yeah. burst of publicity is that what you're uh, trying to uh, to uh, focus on? Is that the? the well, there were steps all the way. Yeah. Huxley was yeah. one of the first. Uh, after we were fired from Harvard, that that mm -hmm. fall. Every major magazine came out with a. Uh, yeah. There was a, a cover story in the Saturday Evening Post. Yeah. Uh, and that spread it. Yeah. yeah. There were three uh, different stories in Playboy. Uh, uh, the, so that was yeah. It was the firing from a Harvard plus the fact that Henry Luce was somewhere always uh, behind the scenes doing certain things. Uh, plus, so many people have been involved in, in uh, Los Angeles and so forth. But that was the first big. Yeah, and Tim was more responsible than anybody for, yeah, for Tim, that. Wasn't it the yeah. calculated goal of FF to cause that? kind of spreading okay. yeah I, I remember coming coming to Cambridge one time when a little article in time came out yeah remember yeah. and <laughs> I walked in there and he said what do you think about the time article it was really devastatingly bad for LSD. I thought it was terrible I said yeah. Tim said we thought it was great you let you you let the, the kids know that uh, there's something here, they'll know it, you know. It doesn't make any difference whether it's bad, good, or indifferent. It's well, I want to point out, though, that the picture, who we all know who's here and now, that. study pictures more than they do uh, long uh, columns. The particular <laughs> picture of this article in Time Magazine attacking our research had a scientific instrument called the uh, experiential typewriter, with all these doubts actually filled with socks, but that's all right. <laughs> it had an incredibly beautiful young woman sitting, taking the test, and it had standing bus behind her Alan Watts, a beautiful female Hindu guru named Gayatri Devi, and myself. Yeah. Now the, uh, the, the signal content of a picture like that was much more important than uh, the little words that are being written by uh, some clerk at Time magazine. In the medical department. <laughs> How about McLuhan? <laughs> now, I'm trying to think, though, that what else could happen in a person's life that a shot from a religious conversion that can fire them up with the sort of zeal that we saw in the few people that we began to use it with. In other words, perhaps not everybody went out. psychosis. Yeah. <laughs> but, but it was a contagion. It was yes, certainly a contagion. Contagious psychosis. It was a contagion. It was, it was a chance. It was a chance for everyone to go to the carnival all at once, you know? Okay. And they all, they all came out of that place and they were ready to really spread the word. I'll tell you, and uh, they, they, about, yeah, they, oh, they, they had had the sacrament, and that's how they behaved in those days. Now, that's a pretty irresistible force in terms of public uh, diffusion of, of information, information, and that was the, the kind of zeal that we experienced. That's people in this room right now, if yeah. we decided to do anything in the next six months, yeah. uh, that was really right. Yeah. You know, it was right. It had to be. You know, we could do it. I'm not so sure. You know, it's amazing yeah. how many times the same mistakes are repeated. Uh, when I first came to Los Angeles, I was working uh, with Murray Jarvik, who's over here, and uh, we were setting up we were setting up some LSD studies to do it, yeah. and with marijuana, a few other drugs. And uh, Allen Ginsberg came by the lab to visit me one day. Yeah. We showed Allen around, and as he was leaving the lab, one of the administrators in the building, so over UCLA, saw him and allegedly saw someone smoking a joint in his entourage. On the basis of that, there was a big flat. And uh, 
it was like another Harvard psilocybin fiasco on a much smaller scale. There was absolutely no uh, truth to any of the charges or anything, but uh, you know, it was, an un- it was an uncomfortable situation. Anyone wanting to do research with these drugs, yeah. even though there was authorization, yeah. there was all the DEA forms, there was all the yeah. necessary uh, uh, precautions that were taken according to law. There's a, a lot of resistance to doing those things. And uh, I've encountered that again and again in every university I've gone to trying to set up these studies. Uh, and if you, it takes a year and a half of paper. I think Murray took us a year and a half of paperwork. I think to, we're, we're in the dark ages. To get the, to get our proposal approved finally. Drug research of that type. And the one thing they kept on coming down. They didn't mind marijuana. We were giving marijuana um, at 11 hallucinogens <coughs> listed on the proposal. And the only one that they, the proposal kept on coming back for was LSD. Yeah. They said, oh, you're going to use LSD, you've got to do a follow-up. You've got to do a, a 90-day follow-up. You've got to do a year-and-a-half follow-up. 30-year follow-up. They didn't care about the mescaline. They didn't care about the psilocybin. They didn't care about ketamine, mm-hmm. which we can give to children. And uh, it's the only drug that we can give to children without any uh, formal... Uh, any hallucinogen that we give to children without any formal well, studies. Well, why is that? Why are these surg- because it's a normal surgical anesthetic yes. given yeah. to uh, hospital patients. Yeah. Excuse me. Oh, me another thing. Uh, we're talking about historical uh, <coughs> moments. Yeah, right. The article that Murray and uh, Frank wrote Classic. in Science of America, and again, at, at another level, was uh, one of the Everest points in all this. Yeah. 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 Thank you for yes. that, Mark. Indeed. And a man who, I, who may come today, who really deserves a, a great deal of consideration in all this, is Nicholas Purcell. And he may come a little later. He said he was going to be here. Nick is a remarkable man, very quiet and in his own way, uh, went to Europe at the very beginning of all this. And I suspect in writing the book that he may have been the very first person to use LSD in America, although that's often accredited to Wrinkle in in, in Boston. And uh, the reason is that he was sitting, you know, he's a Hungarian, and Hungarians get into rather interesting places. And he uh, uh, was talking to to Stoll, the young Stoll, who he said, uh, so he told me, said, by the way, Nick, I know they're talking Hungarian a lot, he said, uh, there's a few things I think you ought to try, and he reached into his waistcoat pocket and took out a few vials, and then here, when you get a chance, he said, you may want to try that. And that was before, uh, uh, to my knowledge, before Rinko ever got the material, and before they set up a regular program for its distribution in America. So if Nick comes later, I, I certainly would would love to see him one and appreciate him. This is like a Grammy Awards session. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. Category first. But no, I, I think it's that. Now, Nick, Nick uh, said you, you saw Nick when he was first starting, didn't you? And he had the material before you did, didn't he? Yes. He, he published yeah. an article in the archives of general psychiatry yeah. very early. Yeah. And then there was the first article about about some of the rape in the Sandoz bibliography were attributed to two Americans named Bush and Johnson yes, of course. in the middle in middle America, who just about never showed up anywhere else. And I called Bush and I said, "Is there really such a person?" You know, and he said, yeah. He said, "I'm 70 years old, and having a marvelous time." I said. Hey, I said, did you realize you were the first person to publish in an American journal on LSD? He said, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> yeah, I he, <laughs> he came to some of the Macy Foundation oh, uh, conferences, yeah, you remember. Yeah, you were there, yeah, I think. Yeah. And I said, how did you get on to it? He said, I don't know. We got the idea that if we had a good delirium going, yeah, he yeah. said, we may both shake things up a bit, you know. <laughs> he said, and Johnson and I, I said, where did you get it? 1940, 50. He said, oh, we just sent the sand. <laughs> Amazing. Well, you, you, know, you, you know the yeah. story about that, don't you? About the Sandal salesman yeah. and LSD. Do you know yeah. that story? Well. But Albert, Albert says that uh, for many years, uh, 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 the, 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 the last time I saw him, he said, the Sandal salesman would come to him and say, When are you going to get something like LSD? <laughs> <laughs> when, when we used to go out, for Sandals, you know, it's quite a small, very respectable Swiss company, and they'd bring their wares along, and no one would show much interest. But after 
say LSD. When the women found our sales on the pair, people would say, you're the people who made LSD. And they would then pay great attention to everyone and their product. And the salesman looks upon this as being the greatest sales innovation that Sandals ever made. <laughs> well, there's another side to that story. When I spoke to Burrell, who was the vice president in charge of public affairs in Hanover, I said to him, I, you know, the usual subject about what happened to LSD. He said, hell, the reason we gave it up is because we couldn't sell it. <laughs> No, but, 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 but he said to him, uh, he takes the wrong view. They were, they, it wasn't, it wasn't the, the, the selling, it was the sales that went with it. <laughs> well, I guess so. But uh, the, I remember Tim coming to the house one day, one morning, and we were all having breakfast, and Robbie, my boy, was just a little fella, and Tim was wearing a hearing aid. I don't think you remember this. And Rob had never seen a hearing aid, and I dearly loved Tim for this. And he said, uh, Tim had a twinkle in his eye, you know, he looked like a real picaresque, you know, Spanish-Irish kind of a guy. And he said, he said, what, uh, what's that? And Tim said, well, that's my direct line to the president. <laughs> <laughs> so, so probably, uh, that was when he was square haircut, you know, and all that stuff, you know. <laughs> not, not, and so Rob said, he said, yeah. He said, what would you like to hear from the president? So, so Rob said, he, he said, he said, how about no school tomorrow? So he said, sure. And he pulls the hearing aid on and puts it in front of him and he said, President Johnson? Yes, yes, yes. He said, Tim Leary here, saying to Janiger. Yes, he said, by the way, he said, the young man here, he said, Rob, he said, he would rather there was no school tomorrow. <laughs> and the next day was a holiday. <laughs> and it's just, and Robbie, and for the most Rob said, is that still ever going to come back? <laughs> <laughs> and I remember old Al Hubbard coming up to the house and he, with his leather pouch, you know, he used to be, the, he rode the circuit boy, and he opened up his leather pouch and then it was all the wampum and all the great stuff he had, and he was trading off. Well, he said, what do we have here for the month now, Al? And Al said, well, we've got this and that, now, and something new's coming up, how would you like a little of that? <laughs> yeah, I remember. Oh, God, we were waiting for you. We were waiting for you like a little lady on the prairie, waiting for the toddler to see his robot channel. Well, I did the best I could for the tool side. Yeah, I know, you, you, and you had some good primitive trade, Al. Al, what did you do with that million dollar check? that you carried around with you. You had a check you showed me for one million dollars. It was the most money I'd ever seen on a check in my life. That's the most I've seen. <laughs> <laughs> it's cost me and other people a lot of money since that. Listen, I'm not telling tales out because I know you showed it to others as well as myself. Well, I think probably it was pretty kind of problem but I had uh, I got, finally got down to $100,000. <laughs> and then, of course, they all went away. They all went away. This all cost a lot of money because there was, a, there was no bills to anyone, to those, anyone except those in charge for it themselves. Mm -hmm. That was only a couple of hospitals mm -hmm. and two or three mm -hmm. clinics. But uh, all it cost a lot of money. Yeah. Was it before inflation or after? <laughs> what? Well, before. It was before inflation. <laughs> when Sid wrote his paper on the complications, <laughs> you remember that? And you sent us a questionnaire about, you know, that was the beginning of trying to assess what, you know, how, what kind of care we should take. And I got the paper and I was thinking, uh, what on earth went wrong? And we had a great number of people. But there was one, uh, which I didn't put on that form, Sid, and I have to tell you, one of our people got loose, and I, I don't know, I have to tell you this now, and we couldn't find him, and this was Wilshire Boulevard, and can you imagine running, uh, and we thought we had the thing well worked out, and the usual babysitter, you know, the usual routine, and he was gone down Wilshire Boulevard, and we were looking all over, and I thought, my God, if this fellow doesn't come to light, we're in bad, bad shape. So I was coming back to the office and feeling kind of glum about it, when suddenly I hear somebody whistling, and I look around, I don't see anything. I look around, nobody whistling, whistling. And there was a patient sitting up in a tree. <laughs> and I, said, I said, what are you doing up there? He said, it's wonderful up there. I said, well, now, don't do anything rash. I said, we'll come here. Oh, no, no. He said, I'll fly right down and see you. I said, oh, you won't. <laughs> and we had to go 
climb the tree and inch over inch for you down off the tree. And thank God for that, I'll tell you. You should have joined him in the tree. <laughs> you should have joined him. You've been in the tree ever since. Seriously? You've been that one before. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Climb out of your tree. Nothing ought to be said about the check that Al was waving around. Because <laughs> it's taken a long time, but it was just a few days ago that the last steps were taken to see that all the money was repaid. But it was a long battle, but all the money went back to its source. Is that right? That's that's right. Uh, <laughs> which money was that, Larry? <laughs> oh, don't you remember? This? Oh, you had several. <laughs> Thank God I didn't have to get involved in the others. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I must say to Al Spence that he never made a lot of money selling that stuff at all. I mean, he, was, he was a great trader, though. He'd say, how about a little... Almost pure cannabis, uh, you know, tetrahydrocannabinol. In those days, you had it was kind of a risky, you know, oil. Remember that stuff in tubes? Yeah. yeah, he yeah, said, yeah. Now, what have you? He said, what have you got to offer? <laughs> <laughs> well, now, how do you how do you figure this belong business, Byron? What? Run back to where it belonged. How do you figure? It? Uh, from the source. Uh -huh. The person who furnished the money got it back. How? <laughs> well. We know how, but it's not a matter for public, I don't think it's a matter for public record. They're among friends. Only Harry is recording it. $10 million. One other um, change in life uh, in connection with LSD, yeah. or at least uh, LSD contributed mightily, I think, was the whole uh, upsurge in the study of the chemistry of the brain. Yeah. I think that had a lot to do with it, and uh, although it may have happened, I think it, uh, LSD accelerated it. Yeah, it's interesting that that was, in, in writing the book, that's part of it, that I think the clinicians somehow, if not disdain that, at least somehow that doesn't seem to be an area of... of terrible concern to them and, and and mainly in terms of the uh, of what I think is this equally important impact of LSD which was on accelerating the entire notion of the neurochemistry of the brain and how the you know the brain processes emotion and so we're trying to include that and it, of course it's going to take a whole other group of people to look at that more critically but I think as you say that chapter is most importantly well worth written entirely I think it was uh, LSD with serotonin, which in turn gave rise perhaps to the early hypotheses of, you know, of the uh, brain amines in relation to affective disorders. That was a direct chain, uh, to a large extent. Yeah. I think uh, yeah. Uh, LSD probably had the uh, most effect on the, on the larger population that has never even taken it to the marginal participation in the, in the counterculture movement, which yeah. I attribute largely to LSD. I'm not attributed to that, but it was, a, I think, a necessary condition. Bill, when we were running, Bill, when we were running our subjects, about the third or fourth subject was an artist, and he saw a Kachina doll that was sitting on the shelf, and he said, I must draw something, I've got to look at something, I've got to paint it. So we took the, the doll off the shelf, and he began to sketch it in, you know, sort of haphazard way as you do, you know, he couldn't control it very well. And when he was through with the experience, he said, this is the most important artistic experience that I've ever had. He said, do you mind if I tell other artists about it? Well, we weren't quite prepared for this. I, I had no idea that the artist, you know, was going to be any more affected than anyone else. And he then began to bring in his friends, and before long, it was almost as if the entire project would be inundated with artists. That's how completely eager and, and absolutely interested they were in taking it. And we had to really limit the number of artists. So at least from their point of view, and then we have a very elaborate record of what, what, uh, what the artists had said and, and the year the follow-up, as you know, because you used some of that data, and the artists seemed to derive an enormous amount 
of, of, of interest and, and of help from the experience with LSD, among all the others. The worst reactors we had were the psychiatrists, <laughs> and, the, and the second were the ministers. I mean, they were, they, they were, they were not, I mean, you know, there was nothing gravely serious, but they were, they, they didn't have good reactions very often, they, the psychiatrists and ministers, and the, the two or three rabbis, and several, uh, we had, I think, two Catholic priests. The general artists have more fun than uh, ministers, don't they? Just well, they may, they, they may have more fun, but then we're going back to your original thesis. They do more yeah. good, then. You know, they, they, they move the human race farther ahead. Artists do that. Right? Well, uh, psychedelic art is still something that has to be evaluated. It's, it's, a, it's an unproven thing, in a way. But we do know that we have a hundred pairs of the artists painting the doll prior and painting it afterwards at a time when they had no preconceived notion. Well, some of course was accumulating, but not very rapidly. And so we now are processing these pairs to see uh, uh, what can be done or how these people handle it under the drug. And if they took it a number of times, they had it, they developed a, a facility so they could deal with it and they could paint fairly decently on it. You know? yeah, that one with the leaf. Yeah, yeah that one with the, the leaf. An old yeah. friend of mine sent me a copy of that one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'd like yeah. to understand that a little better. Yeah. Uh, with the doll, you say you yeah. first had them paint it before they'd taken the LSD yeah. and then during. Yes. And how about, did you do any after? Anyway? Yes. Mm -hmm. There was some we did after, yeah. Mm -hmm. because, yeah. I'd be interested there whether yeah. they felt that they had some enhanced ability afterward. Well, but they, uh, yeah. Well, what was improved wasn't their artistic ability by no means. It was just the, this whole sense of opening up, you know, and having more choices and being able to see things uh, 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 much more, uh, many more permutations and ideas. Would you all like to have some something to eat? Uh, and uh, we've got a table full of stuff. Yeah. Well, we, we really don't know. Just I think he has a I'm glad you I'm glad you